Good evening, members. Welcome to today's uh, CP Study Circle meet on uh, country by country reporting, nuances and recent developments. So, I request uh, Bangalore Branch Chairman CA Pramod Hegde to escort the speaker for the day, Bharat CS Bharat Lakshmi Narayana. And I request CA Pramod Hegde to hand over a floral bouquet to the speaker. Bangalore Branch Chairman C. Pramod Hegde to give a welcome address for the day. Thank you. Good evening, members. Welcome you all for this pivotal study circle meeting, CPCR reporting. Basically, a recent development, recent development and uh, nuances in CPCR reporting. We were just discussing down with the speaker. Of course, firstly, I would like to thank you for uh, taking this up and you know giving this study circle a very good essence of CBCR reporting. So we were just discussing that why this topic and how many of us are into this practice. So I was just telling him that we are looking at each professional opportunity, and this is one of that big professional opportunity which most of us are not into. So we are, when it comes to income tax, we are very happy doing our income tax return, day-to-day -day filing. Yes, of course, now there's a bigger picture which is coming in. So we just thought, my take was, why not let's talk about CDCR reporting. And this is a very big forte for big fours and probably in the global, in the Western scenario as well. But in our current own profession and Bangalore being a very niche practice, which has been there for a long time. So this becomes a very good pivotal aspect in our profession. So when I was just talking about the CBCR reporting, what, is that, what I personally face probably let me put off to the speaker so that he can address that and probably then take up their questions as well. There are quite a lot of forms, TCAC, TCA, there's quite a lot of 10 forms. First of all, we don't know what form to be filled at all. If, if someone says, okay, you have international transaction, you just fill this, you don't need part B. So there's quite a lot of confusion even for that. And suppose if form 1 is applicable, whether there's another form which is going to be applicable, we don't know. They say part A, part B, and when that triggers. And of course, the thresholds are pretty large in this scenario. And secondly, a uh, lot of people did ask me that, how was it similar to transfer pricing? So is it similar? Because most of them said, of course, there are quite a lot of questionnaires when we come to master file, that we call master and CBCR and master file are two different aspects to it. So is it that same thing which we do in tax pricing, which goes here in this master file? And how does this work? So these were the very critical questions which have been faced by the professionals. I request you to put a light on that also. In case the time permits for you, something on master file as well saying that what are the differences and intricacies, so what is that they should keep in mind before they talk, talk or work on it. With this, I welcome you all. Without too much time, we are already late by 10 minutes, so we will hand this stage to the speaker. Before that, I would like to call uh, C.S. Shripad to give, them, give a brief about the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman C.A. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker for the day, technical speaker for the day. C.S. Bharat Lakshmi Narayan, he is a BCom graduate, company secretary uh, and also uh, LLB. Uh, Bharat Lakshmi Narayan is associated with the ISDU uh, LLB Bangalore. He has over 16 years of experience in the field of taxation. He focuses on advising clients on Indian domestic and cross-border tax issues, tax optimization strategies, transfer pricing and exchange control matters. He also regularly attends to matters involving representation before the tax authorities and the uh, ITAT. He is also presently a co-convener for Bangalore Study Group of Chamber of Tax Consultants, Mumbai. He has spoken at the Bangalore Study Circle of the ICI of Income Tax, Transfer Pricing and Exchange Control Topics. So with this brief introduction, I present to, uh, I present before you uh, C.S. Bharat Lakshmi Narayana. Over to you. Good 
good evening. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, a fairly thin crowd on an esoteric topic like I mentioned to Chairman Pramod. Uh, but then uh, it's a, a, a very interesting uh, uh, subject, uh, especially when uh, we ourselves on our own, uh, unless there is any work related uh, point, we wouldn't want to read on uh, this topic. Like uh, uh, Chairman Pramod mentioned, it's important that despite we not having such circumstances, at least we do uh, familiarize ourselves with uh, the form and uh, the utilities of uh, uh, the CBCR, the concept itself. And uh, like uh, uh, Chairman Pramod mentioned, uh, non surprising master file CBCR, they are generally referred to in one breath. Uh, and uh, many practitioners wouldn't uh, distinguish one from the other, or rather, uh, to put it this way, they they uh, yeah they speak about it in the same way, but there are some subtle differences, uh, uh, so to say. So what I will do, uh, since uh, Chairman Pramod mentioned about Master Pile also, uh, that's when I asked him, uh, you have to do a separate session on Master Pile itself, because that is a, a more relevant topic, and there are a uh, lot of finer aspects in uh, Master Pile. Uh, which are relevant to day-to-day -day practitioners when compared to CPCR itself. So since uh, that point came up, what I will do is, I will spend maybe 10-15 minutes on master file and then I will come into uh, CPCR because that's the progression. Uh, in fact, uh, that uh, is uh, rather uh, the, the hierarchy which uh, OECD itself has uh, placed saying that uh, from a base inversion and profit uh, shifting the standpoint, it is important that taxpayers maintain three levels of documentation. The first is the transfer pricing local thing. So there we are fairly uh, familiar, Form 3 CB we file every year. There, are, uh, there is also the TP documentation which is also uh, kept and uh, uh, kept and uh, our tax authorities scrutinize the transfer pricing documentation and uh, proceed with the assessments. That is the first tire, tire one uh, of the uh, 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 BEPS documentation file. This again comes from uh, the BEPS report action plan 13 of the OECD. So if you can Google search uh, for that report, you will find that report where they have talked about this three tire documentation. So uh, our local file, our uh, typical DP documentation is the first tire. The second tire is the master file. What is a master file? The master file is supposed to record uh, transactions, uh, uh, rather uh, arrangements of the group in with respect to various parameters and the thresholds there. So again, the three-tier approach is has got more to do with thresholds rather than anything. What is the basis of the thought process behind three tiers? It's primarily got to do with size of the organization. So every uh, multinational enterprise which enters into transactions with companies around the world without any transaction uh, threshold limit is required to keep the master file. Then, if there are, if the group's uh, transactions uh, with its, uh, rather if the, if the entity's transactions with its group companies exceeds a particular threshold, in the Indian context it is taken as 500 crore. If it exceeds 500 crore, then a master file should be kept. And if the transaction, uh, rather the group turnover exceeds 6,400 6, crore today, uh, then the group should maintain the country by country report. So these are the three tires, right? And today the topic is the third tire itself. So I'll just spend briefly some time on the second tire and then we'll go into the CBCR. The second tire, uh, like Chairman Pramod mentioned, is the master tire. And uh, in master file uh, uh, in India, form 3CE AA has been notified. And uh, 3CE AA comprises of two parts, part A and part B. Now, uh, part A is a very simple form. It only requires particulars of the entity uh, which has related party transactions with its group companies outside India or the associated enterprises. The, uh, so as part of part A, the taxpayer's name and address and the parent, the multinational group to which it relates to, 
the name of that multinational group and the address of that multinational group and what is the uh, accounting period of that multinational group. That information is sought for in part A. Now part A is to be mandatorily filed by any entity irrespective of the threshold as long as there are international transactions which have been entered into. So part A is a simple one page uh, and uh, we file that on or before the due date of filing the return. So uh, for the 3 CEP, the time limit is one month before the filing of the return. Uh, the part A of uh, form 3 CEAA is to be filed on or before the due date of filing the return. Now comes part B. When does part B apply? Part B applies in two scenarios when uh, the value of international transactions exceeds 500 crore or sorry, the value of international transactions in respect of goods or services exceeds 500 crore or value of intangible transactions exceeds 50 crore. In one of those two conditions, they are satisfied, part B triggers. And part B is a fairly exhaustive listing of information. And uh, what part B seeks to gather is a macro view of the multinational group. How is the multinational group operating? What are the processes within the multinational group in its goods or services? And uh, what are the uh, broad intercompany arrangements which that group has <coughs> with its entities around the world? So that kind of information is something which the master file captures. And uh, uh, one of the more important points is it requires the consolidated financials of the group to be also filed. So if it's a Singapore headquartered group and uh, the Indian subsidiary has transactions exceeding uh, the particular thresholds, then uh, we have to uh, upload the consolidated financial statements of that Singapore entity. So these are all multiple dimensions which are there and virtually the master file is virtually a, a backgrounder, so to say, of the group itself which the Indian tax authority can see at the time of the TP assessment of that Indian entity. So the beauty of the master file uh, uh, concept is that <coughs> the tax authorities are given information not only of the Indian entity but also of the global arrangements which that group has because this macro view is something which is very important for a tax authority to assess the base inversion and profit shifting compliance so to say of that group. So for example if you take say Microsoft, so Microsoft is based out of the US, it has subsidiaries in India, uh, I am sure Microsoft will be filing its uh, uh, master file. What happens is, so anyways Microsoft will be having its TP report, but in the TP report, there is very little information about the group itself. The focus in the master file, I am sorry, the focus in the transfer pricing study is only of the transactions which Microsoft India has entered into the group companies, which gives one kind of a perspective. However, a master file gives the perspective from Microsoft US standpoint which is also important for a tax administrator to assess when he proceeds with the income tax, trans, I'm sorry, transfer pricing assessment of say Microsoft. So that is the information which master file seeks to gather. Then comes the tier 3 which is the CBCR which is the subject matter for today. CBCR the thresholds are very high. Initially it started off in India it started off at 5500 5, or 750 million dollars or euros as the case may be. That was the OECD standard which India converted into 5,500 crores. Today it is 6,400 crores. So if the multinational group, right, if the multinational group's consolidated revenues are in excess of 6,400 crores, then that group is required to find a CBCR in a particular jurisdiction. What about the national focus increase? Sorry? What was the rational for this increase of? What was the? Rational for this Yeah, that's simply because of inflationary global growth. Uh, yeah, this, uh, the, the, the CBCR first came into play in about 2017. 2017, they started out with a 5,500 crore threshold. 
in uh, 23 so sorry this this amendment happened in 21 no it happened last year so last year onwards uh, we started applying 6,000 for my group, 22, 23, sorry, 22, 23, uh, 6,400 for a kid. Uh, and uh, again, who has to file CBCR, etc., we'll just see through the uh, next uh, couple of hours. So, so. Um, while the agenda is overview, nuances, recent developments, I will confess that the recent developments are extremely limited because uh, uh, CBCR is one such compliance which has achieved stable state already. So there are some grievances which, which uh, uh, multinationals had. They continue to be the same from the day the CBCR was introduced till today. So in that sense there has not been much change in the format of the CBCR. Some clarifications have been given but uh, uh, nothing substantial. So in that sense uh, in terms of developments there is not much. We focus on the nuances. So, like I said, uh, the uh, CBCR came from the 2015 Web Action Plan, uh, Action 13 report titled TP Documentation and Country by Country Reporting. Like I said, this is the last tier of a three tiered approach for TP Documentation. So, in that sense, uh, just to take off from what uh, Chairman Pramod mentioned. Is CBCR connected to transfer pricing? Answer is both yes and no. Master pay is it connected to uh, transfer pricing? Answer is both yes and no. Because why yes and no? Yes, because OECD connects it to transfer pricing and conceptually they start off with the related party transactions. From related party transactions, both these documents, namely uh, master file and CPC are start, but they don't stop there. They broaden their yes to something much more than related party transactions which is what we will see. So what is CBCR? CBCR requires aggregate tax jurisdiction wide information relating to the global allocation of the income taxes paid and certain indicators of the location of economic activity among tax jurisdictions in which the ME group operates. So this is straight from the OECD report. Right? Straight from the OECD report. Why did they bring in CBCR? So this was the rationale. The report also requires a listing of all the constituent entities for which financial information is reported including the tax jurisdiction of incorporation where, dif where different from the tax jurisdiction of residence as well as the nature of the main business activities carried out by that constitu constituent entity. So as we see the form we will observe all of these uh, concepts a little more closely. <coughs> CPCR would be helpful for high level transfer pricing risk assessment purposes. And the kind of information which is now available to tax authorities, I believe, has freely lived up to this object. So uh, we will go through some CBCRs which were, which have been publicly published by some of the large multinationals, and with that we will be able to see how this objective has been achieved. Tax administrations may also use this in evaluating other debts related risks and where appropriate for economic and statistic analysis. The OECD itself, in fact, has collated uh, uh, data from all the CBCR findings and it itself has undertaken some analysis which I will also present, which has, uh, which actually clearly satisfies this objective. However, the information in the CBCR should not be used as a substitute for a detailed, for a detailed TP analysis of individual transactions and prices based on full functional analysis and full comparability analysis. So this is a KPI which the OECD itself has stated and said that yes, there is CBCR information, but CBCR is not a shortcut. It gives a macro view, it gives a bird's eye view, but then you still have to go deep deep into the FAR and the economic analysis so that you can complete your TP assessment. And uh, some pitfalls of using the CBCR also we will see with uh, some data. So, just to take the same statement forward, though OECD says CBCR information on its own does not constitute conclusive evidence that transfer prices are or are not appropriate. It should not be used by tax administrations to propose TP adjustments based on global formulary apportionment of income. This is a temptation. 
So if you see a CBC as a value uh, uh, you guys do the slides, you will see this temptation comes if you are sitting in the tax office session. Okay, I will show how. Okay, and that is where OECD clearly wants and states that you no, know, you should not be engaged in uh, formulary apportionment. What is formulary apportionment? Taking global profits and saying in India, so uh, say uh, 10 billion dollars is a global profit. Uh, uh, India comprises about 10% uh, in headcount, so to say, and therefore say 10% of the 10 billion should be attributed to India. Some such random rule of thumb kind of thing which you should not be doing because that is the kind of data which CDCR gives, which we will see. Right, and the temptation is very high, especially in India, where formula reapportionment was extensively used to tax multinationals. <coughs> so, in this backdrop, three forms were introduced. Forms 3CAC, 3CEAD, 3CEAC, three forms. Each form has distinct purposes. Right? They are effective rule, uh, effective October 2017, November 2017, November, by rule 10DV. 3CEAD is identical to the OECD template and that is the CDCR itself. Okay. 3CEAC and 3C, sorry, please read that as 3CEAE. Okay. There is a typo there. 3CEAC and 3CEAE are intimation forms. Forms for intimation. CEAD is the CDCR. Okay. Kindly note that correction. So now, who should file this CBCR in India? In India, the CBCR in form 3CEAD. We will go to 3CAC, 3CAE, small mentions, nothing uh, significant. 3CEAD should be filed by every parent entity resident in India or an alternative, alternate reporting entity of an international group resident in India. Okay. So in India, CBCR should be filed by one of these two people. Okay, but then again the catch is the threshold of 6400 crore. Okay. <coughs> uh, parent entity resident in India. So typically Indian multinationals whose turnovers exceed 6400 crore consolidated, they should find CDC. So all our Indian multinationals will have multinationals will have in process the name. They should mandatorily file the CDCR in India or an alternate reporting entity of an international group resident in India. So, if there is a multinational group which has nominated its Indian affiliate, okay, so that international group, it's not a not an Indian resident in that sense. It's a say for example a US group, US based group, but it nominates its Indian subsidiary to file the CBCR for whatever reasons. Okay, so for whatever reasons, the US group nominates its Indian subsidiary to file the CBCR. That is the alternate reporting entity. So the main reporting entity is a parent entity, but it has called itself back and said, no, no, I will engage, I will appoint this entity, the Indian affiliate as the alternate reporting entity. Right? That will file the CBCR in India. And Alternate reporting entity should be resident in India. So typically its Indian subsidiary will be resident in India and therefore it can do the need for. So when should it be filed? It should be filed within 12 months from the end of the reporting accounting year of the international group. So the international, so there is no due date like March 31st, September 30th, October 31st, November 30th. There is no time limit like this for CBC. CBCR's timeline is dependent on the accounting year of the international group. So, if the international group's accounting year is the calendar year, right? So for example, if the calendar, I mean, and it follows the calendar year, uh, for 23, calendar year 23, the due date of filing the CBCR is 31st December 24, right? So, it boils down to the accounting year of the international group. Okay, there is no prescribed time. This is the time. And then how do you compute the 6400 crore limit? It should be taken, rate of exchange is based on the telegraphic uh, 
transfer the ingredient of such currency and the last day of the accounting year preceding the accounting year. Okay. <coughs> then uh, there are some, some other concepts which we will have to go through. Constituent entity of the international group to intimate the ITD, whether it is the A IG's ARE or details of the P of the IG's ARE, if any, and the country or territory of which the said entities are resident. So, uh, this is effectively from 3CEAC. Okay. So, 3CEAC is again, uh, say, let's take if you take Microsoft itself. <coughs> Microsoft in the US, it assume, let's assume Microsoft in the US is filing a CDC. Microsoft India should intimate the income tax department that look, I am part of the Microsoft group. The Microsoft group is supposed to file a CDCR. It is filing a CDCR in the US. So that intimation is from 3 CDCR. And what will happen with that intimation? With that intimation, the income tax department through the exchange of information process, right? So all these double taxation avoidance agreements also have this article on exchange of information and through that process they are empowered to request the internal revenue service of the US or any other statutory authority for information in relation to a taxpayer. So through the exchange of information process the income tax department through the CBDT etc. competent authority it will reach out and to the US and say to the IRS in the US and say look Microsoft's Indian subsidiary has told us that Microsoft US is filing a CBCR with you. We want to have access to that CBCR. Therefore, under the exchange of information provisions of the DDAA, double taxation avoidance agreements, please share with us the CBCR. So that is the so-called proper channel through which the in Indian tax authorities will gain access to the CBCR filed by Microsoft unless unless Microsoft has published its CBCR on its own website so that everybody can access right? else this is the proper channel through which it has to be it will be rather open okay and the starting point for this is the form 3 CAC form 3 CAC is the form which will tell the income tax department that this entity is part of a multinational group which files a CBC. So, a very important form, right? And of course, as long as the thresholds are satisfied, it is imperative for them, they have no choice but to file it. P to file the CBCR or ARE to file the CBCR or C to intimate that P is a non-resident and filing CBCR in another country. So for example, if a P can also be engaged to file the CBCR. So those are some final aspects. So, so. Then comes this identification of what is a constituent entity, what is an international group, what is a consolidated financial statement, what is a parent entity. Okay. Very important if the if there are some some subtle dimensions which we go through. Okay, C constituent entity, any separate entity, those excluded solely on the basis of materiality should also be included. So what happens with CBCR? The focus is on the consolidated financials, right? And which are all the entities which go to make up the consolidated financials. And the premise is if consolidated financials have factored entity ABC, entity ABC become constituent entities. Right? And then the principles of consolidation go with the generally account, generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, international accounting standards as the case. Now it sometimes it so happens that on the basis of materiality, some entities may not be consolidated. Right. Only because of materiality. So the question that used to come up was, because of materiality, if my results are not gotten consolidated, does it mean that that entity is not a constitutive entity? The answer is no. So the OECD has clarified that 
assume for a moment that on account of materiality my results have not got consolidated, even then I continue to be a CE or a constitutive entity. Right. What is given is entities which have gotten consolidated. They are no doubt, no questions asked, they become constitutive entities. What if for materiality purposes? They don't. And for example, P is permanent establishments also. The other part is, the other part of C is P's, permanent establishments, what about them? They are not separate entities, right? Permanent establishments are, are uh, fictions of a double taxation avoidance okay. they, they do not exist in reality. It's not, a, it's, not in, it's not something which has a separate legal entity. It's a legal fiction, right? What about them? Okay. So the answer is, even those have to be brought in and this becomes extremely tricky. So it's fairly straightforward when we have to take only constituent entities, legal entities easily trackable. Okay? But P's become very tricky because P's are not reflected in the consolidation. They are considered only for tax purposes. Right? This becomes quite tricky. Right? And these are some of the concerns which multinationals have expressed. Saying boss you, you in, consol in consolidation itself, uh, because of the size of, uh, of the group, it's a nightmare. Now you are asking us to also track the tax dimension of, of uh, consolidation through PS. I mean, it's it's a very humongous task. Right? And, and uh, but but the OECD is very clear that look, PS have added value to whatever you did in a particular. <coughs> Therefore, we simply cannot afford to ignore them. It's your call. You, if especially when you yourself are conceding that there's a P, you have no business not to tell us about that P. The premise is simply that that if the taxpayer itself has acknowledged that there's a P, say for example, a US entity has a P in India, and that P has reported significant uh, tax liabilities in India. There is no reason why the multinational should not report that P as part of CBC. Okay? That's a simple premise. On the other hand, if the tax authorities are imputing a P, it's a different question. Right? But if the taxpayer is voluntarily saying that, yes, I have a P, the OECD simple response is, if you are conceding a P, why don't you report it? Because the CBCR is supposed to give a macro view of all your activities around the world. So you please include them. That is simple. <coughs> IG, international group. Two or more enterprises which are resident of different countries or territories. So as long as there are two or more entities, you become an international group. You need not have ten entities or seven. Two or more. Okay. Two or more, 6,400. CFS, Consolidated Financial Statements. Yeah. Presented as those of a single economic entity, equity approach is a line by line approach. So, this is one of the first principles of drawing up consolidated financial statements. So, in uh, uh, preparing consolidated financial statements, the typical approach that is adopted is what is called with a single economic entity approach. It's an accounting concept. And the basis that accounting concept. <coughs> based on the control, so to say, which the parent entity has on a particular entity, <coughs> the consolidation happens. Say, uh, you can get a nice flavor of this if we appreciate how joint ventures are. Right? Joint ventures, <coughs> if they have to be consolidated, then, and especially assume for example, a joint venture where the uh, uh, the parent entity has less than 50 percent. So in that sense, it is not controlling that joint venture entity. <coughs> but then, there are significant international transactions with that entity. So the question is, if the joint venture entity <coughs> having uh, uh, and in which the parent entity has less than 49, 49 percent or less, which has significant related party revenues, will it get consolidated? So, 
From an accounting standpoint, they adopt what is called the equity approach vis-a-vis -vis line by line approach. This is an accounting concept. So in the equity approach, the premise is if there is equity control on the equity, then only we will consolidate rather than a line by line approach. In a line by line approach, everybody is pulled in. Everybody is pulled in, in a line by line approach in contrast with the equity approach. Okay, for example, so in the same JV is not consolidated in a equity approach. It gets consolidated only by line by line approach. Therefore, the joint venture equity, okay, it wouldn't have figured in the CFS at all. So now the question comes for such a joint venture entity in India, should they file from CPSC, assuming that the parent group is filing a CPC? This is one settled point which we actually which came up for one of our own clients many years, a few years back. And we took a position that because you guys have adopted an equity approach, which will be line by line approach, and you have not consolidated the joint ventures results in the parent entity, therefore you are not uh, a constituent entity in that sense and therefore you do not fall within the ambit of 286 red with root 10 db therefore don't find the 3 series this is a tactic we have to track so before we take a decision whether or not to file a form 3 cac forget 3 ca 3 cac if we have to take a decision we have to go through all of the definitions of the Am I a constituent entity? Are my results consolidated in the CFS? Okay, an extremely subtle uh, point uh, over here. Then parent entity is the entity that is required to prepare the CFS. Okay. <coughs> Simply put. Then the forms which we discussed. 3 CAC form for information gathering in case CBCR is being filed elsewhere by PE or ARE not resident in India. Uh, intimation to be filed two months prior to the due date of the CBCR. So, that case of 22, uh, 23 calendar year, due date is 31st December. By 31st October, the 3 CAC should be filed saying, my parent entity is filing the CBCR there in some particular. 3CAD is the main CBCR aligned to the OECD model to be filed within 12 months from the end of its reporting for 31st December in this example. 3CAE filing applies when P is resident of a country or territory with which India does not have an information exchange agreement or there is systemic failure in respect of the information exchange agreement with India. So, 3CAE is a form which is filed in a peculiar circumstance. What is that peculiar circumstance? Like I said, CBCR access is dependent on exchange of information. Article of the applicable DAWA. Not all DAWAs have exchange of information. Of late, in the past few years, India has been engaging extensively with country, all of its treaty partner countries to have this exchange of information article inserted. And then so basically, if there is no exchange of information article in the DTWA, you cannot get India cannot get access to the CBCR. That aspect should be intimated to the income tax department. That I am dealing in with, I am engaging in the, uh, I am part of a group, parent parent entity, which is not part of, which does not have an exchange of information article. That intimation is given in 3 CEA or there is a systemic failure in respect of the information of exchange agreement with India. So the TTWA has an exchange of information class, but then that other country has consistently violated that exchange of information class. That is what is called a systemic failure. <coughs> the systemic failure business is also very tricky. Right? Now how do we know? That, that particular country has systemically, uh, con continuously violated the terms. Okay. So as of now, there has been no such scenario, as of now. Maybe a few years down the line, we will get to know all of this. A good case was uh, not in this context, but in the context of uh, 
general exchange of information was Cyprus. So, because there was no uh, smooth exchange of information with Cyprus, India had blacklisted that country. Right? And therefore, payments made to a Cypriot entity used to suffer the highest rate of withholding tax despite India having the Cyprus DDWA. Despite a Cyprus DDWA, the highest rate of tax was applied because India clearly said it was you have been a blacklisted country, I will not deal with you in terms of my DDWA. And only recently was the blacklisting and only recently, recently, rather a few years back, Cyprus was removed from the blacklist and it resumed normal uh, relations on huh? exchange of information. So, this will be publicly known. In the context of CBCR, as of now, there is nothing like this. We can leave it. Here. <coughs> Again, the due date for this is 12 months from the end of the reporting of the year. Now we will go to the CBCR. We go to the main form. So, CAC, CAE are fairly simple forms, okay, which trigger only in those peculiar uh, circumstances. CAE is a peculiar circumstance. CAC is a simple form which asks for basic information, name, address, reporting account here, your parent group, address of your parent group. Will you have any other entities in India? Fairly straightforward. <coughs> CBCR is now the more interesting and uh, dynamic kind of form. But, so, there is uh, one preliminary part where they ask information on the name, address and all of that. After that comes part Overview of allocation of income taxes and business activities by tax jurisdiction. And by tax jurisdiction. That is the whole premise for calling it country by country reporting. They call it country by country reporting. Okay, so, they look at it based on tax jurisdiction. In one tax jurisdiction, the multinational group can have 10 subsidiaries. Can have 10 <coughs> subsidiaries. But for CDCR purposes, it should combine all 10. And it will be one line item. Okay, I will give you an example, although that is later in the Are you able to see the screen, uh, the, the line items? Not really? No? Okay, so basically this is the CBCR of Anglo-American. Anglo-American is one of the largest mining companies in the world. One of the world's largest mining companies. Amongst the more popular companies which it holds are the DBS diamond companies. DBS ultimate holding company is Anglo-American. DBS, you all of you guys have heard of diamonds, yes. South African diamonds, or rather African diamonds. So, Anglo American is the parent entity of that group. Okay. So, basically, if you see here, so Anglo American has made public its CBCR. You just to give a Google search of Anglo American CBCR, you can download it. Okay. And kindly see the same form how they have fit. Australia. Australia, the first uh, line item is Australia. So, in Australia, they have multiple entities, okay, but a single line item. Next, Belgium, multiple entities in Belgium. Bermuda, similarly. Botswana, similarly. Brazil, Singapore. I just extracted the key jurisdictions for Anglo America, okay. The, the CBCR runs up to, this document runs up to about 80 pages. Fantastic document. Right? It's uh, so enlightening to read uh, that document. I've taken only snips of that. Brazil, Singapore, South Africa. So, please see, one single line item, they have consolidated multiple entities. And this was one of the first questions which multinationals got, saying, look, we consolidate at a global level. We don't consolidate results at a jurisdictional level. OEC says we are not bothered about it. You please do it. And that is one challenge. And that is where the, the, the nice part of CBCR is 
after part A, there is part B, we will come to it. Part C, additional information. Name of the multinational enterprises group, reportable accounting here. Please include any further brief information or explanation that is considered necessary or that would facilitate the understanding of the compulsory information provided in part A and part B. So this is the notes section. So whatever assumptions we make here, okay, we ought to state it in part C. Okay. So here, so we will go to, so tax jurisdiction, all of you are able to relate. It's a jurisdiction by jurisdiction, not an entity by entity thing. So it is a mammoth task. Because what happens, assume there are 10 entities in, say, India, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. There may be related party transactions between A and B itself. And B and J. And B and uh, F. Okay, or F and I. Okay. In a consolidation exercise, what happens? These related party transactions get knocked off. Right? But then, because that group does not do a jurisdiction by jurisdiction consolidation, there will be double counting. Right? That is where the next two columns, unrelated <coughs> party, related party information. In total, this is what it is. Okay, and then the total revenue. So, what CBCR presupposes is a simple addition of all unrelated and related party revenues of all those entities in a particular jurisdiction. Don't apply your mind on knocking off. Simply add and put to the input that number is what it asks. There will be double counting. Yes, there will be double counting. This is an inherent presumption in the CBCR. And that is where the OECD has given those questions. Please don't see CBCR blindly. You have to do a local check. So those caveats are all there. And when we see the nitty gritties of this part, we will get to know the importance of those caveats. Right? So again, we we'll just uh, jump again into that Anglo-American uh, CBCR. Okay, so Australia related unrelated party revenues of the all in Australia is around 2.4 billion dollars. The related party revenues are around 76 million dollars. On the other hand, in Botswana, okay, Botswana is a mineral rich country in Africa, 3.8 billion dollars of unrelated party transactions, 2.6 billion dollars of related party transactions. There are some 10 entities or something. Yeah, if you see this, so they have listed which are all the entities. Okay, they have around uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight entities in Botswana. So that line item is an aggregation of those eight line eight entities. Okay. Similarly, Brazil. Right? Brazil. The total unrelated party revenues are 144 billion. The total related party revenues are 3.8 billion. Right? And there are so many entities which we saw. So how will you how will you arrive at an inference just by seeing this? It's a bit tricky. Right? One thing which you can make out is the quantum of related party transactions are fairly high. So that begs the question: what is happening in Brazil for the Anglo-American group? Okay, the good part there is Anglo-American in its own report. There is a further section <coughs> which goes jurisdiction wise and says these are all the activities which we are having in Brazil or Botswana. Okay, this is also there, etc., etc. Okay, they, they, I mean, so each jurisdiction you will get these questions. Okay, sorry, uh, before uh, we get carried away with that, right? we will get this question by seeing the first two columns alone. What about the other columns? What are the next columns? Okay, the, the form looks so simple. When we see the form here, it looks so simple. These are the nitty gritties. Okay, unrelated party, related party, total fine. Profit loss before income tax. Okay, nothing doing. Simply adding up, inputting the number. Okay, fine. That is also okay. 
and income tax paid on cash basis. Fantastic question. Juxtaposed with the next column, income tax accrued. Okay. So uh, let's uh, the, the the OECD has given explanations on all of this. We will go through that. Okay. Stated capital. Then accumulated earnings, number of employees. Lastly, tangible assets other than cash and cash values. They are not talked about financial investments. They are not talked about intangible assets. They have talked only about tangible assets. There is no column for intangibles or financial financial assets. Conspicuously, the capital. Right? Just see that. Then comes uh, part B. Part B, what it asks is, in this tax jurisdiction, you have uh, uh, constituent, multiple constituent entities. What do those constituent entities do? Okay. <coughs> Research and development, holding or managing, purchasing or uh, procurement, manufacturing or production, sales, marketing or distribution, administration, management and support services. So if there are entities which do multiple activities, we have to tick. Okay, we go to Anglo American only to understand how this is. So this is part B of the Anglo American uh, report. Okay, and if you see Botswana, there are multiple entities. See the first entity. Okay, Ambase Prospecting, Botswana PTY Limited. What is the nature of uh, activity? Dormant. It is a dormant entity. Additional remarks, additional entity information, involuntary, involuntary liquidation. Even that we have to stick. As long as that entity has not been liquidated, it, it will come in CDC. Okay, next line item. Anglo-American Corporation Botswana Services Limited. They have ticked the part of administrative management of support services. That part they have ticked. So that entity is doing that activity. Next, DBS Global Site Holder Sales PTY Limited. They have ticked sales, marketing, or distribution. So each entity, they have to briefly state what it does. If there are multiple segments, they will tick both. <coughs> Then, uh, for example, this Brazilian entity is a good example. Anglo-American Nickel Brazil Limited. It is engaged in research and development. It is engaged in manufacturing and production. It is engaged in sales and marketing. It is engaged in administrative support services. Four segments are there that uh, entity. All of this is This is the degree of detailing which is simple for a sector. Extremely powerful form. Hats off to their intelligence in drafting such a simple form. Prime of is such a simple form to look at. More simple than our ITR1 to look at, it's more simple than ITR1, but when we start feeling it, it's a hell of a journey. Right? Because the kind of information it throws up, just visualize. All of this information is if it is available to an Indian tax officer, okay, and he compares what, uh, how how India is positioned in this largest uh, scheme of things, which we will see a little later, okay. Uh, I have taken the shell uh, CBCR and I will just uh, show that to you, okay. Uh, actually, Anglo American itself has very limited operations in India. In India it has extremely limited operations, but uh, there is this point on Singapore, so which we will see. Okay. If you see here, Singapore, very interesting, Anglo-American itself. Singapore, unrelated party transactions, 24 billion. Singapore, Botswana, if you recollect, Botswana, where they have a lot of mines, diamonds, diamond mines, gold mines, etc. Unrelated party transactions, 3 billion. Singapore, 24 billion, unrelated party revenues. Okay. And they put a small note over there, we will go through that note also. Related party transactions in Singapore, only 1.8 billion. Okay. 
So total Singapore 26 billion dollars. Okay, it is higher than the next line item South Africa. In South Africa, unrelated unrelated party revenues are one billion. Related party revenues are 21 billion. Okay, and DPS is headquartered in uh, South Africa. South African uh, headquartered uh, group. Okay, now let's see the note which they have put for Singapore in the next page. Uh, I'm sure when the slides are up uploaded on the website, okay, you guys can just zoom into this and read this. Okay. I, I couldn't do this in any better way. My apologies. Anglo-American has operations in Singapore, including a dedicated regional sales and marketing hub for the sale and trading of products sourced from Anglo equity mines and third-party suppliers, and a shipping hub that provides freight services for the transportation of cargoes across the Anglo-American route. Any related party transactions are conducted on an arm's length basis in accordance with OECD principles and local legislation. Anglo American pays corporate income tax on the profits it derives on the running of the regional sales and marketing hub and shipping activities in Singapore in accordance with legislated tax incentives granted to Anglo American for the significant contributions made to the Singaporean economy. The innocuous statement. It will throw more questions than answers. What? Uh, okay, we'll finish. We'll finish the road and then come back to this line item. Okay. Uh, stated capital accumulated earnings, number of employees. We'll we'll check uh, what's happened in Singapore on that. In Anglo Americans, yes. So uh, total revenues twenty six billion dollars, Singapore. Okay, profit or loss before tax nine fifty nine million. Income tax paid on cash basis on a 959 million profit is negative 46 million. Despite a close to 1 billion dollar profit, the cash paid on the tax paid on cash basis is negative 46 million. Right. Next column: income tax paid, income tax accrued. Negative 48 million in Singapore. This is the kind of information CBCR is supposed to have. Doesn't it raise questions saying, boss, you made a 1 billion dollar profit in Singapore, you are not paying taxes in Singapore. And then in that note, there is a significant contributions to Singaporean economy. What are you talking about? That's a question which begs an answer. The next, stated capital 183 million. Uh, 183 million uh, stated capital, they have 26 billion dollars of revenue. Okay. Then next column, accumulated earnings. Okay. Accumulated earnings is negative 1 billion on 26 billion of current year revenue. They have a negative accumulated earnings, accumulated profits of 1 billion. Negative. Okay. Number of employees 351. Tangible assets other than cash and cash equivalents 419 million. Okay. CBCR effective tax rate 5%. Statutory corporate tax rate in Singapore 17%. This is exactly what CBCR wants to tax. The stated tax rate in the country is 17. These guys are paying 5. For whatever reasons, this is a starting point for an inquiry, especially by the Singapore IRS. Singapore IRS will be curious to understand, boss, in uh, Singapore, uh, you have 351 employees and have made 1 billion of profit. In South Africa, you have 41,000 employees. Okay, your total revenue is 22 billion dollars. Your PPT is 10 billion dollars in South Africa. See the, the, the dichotomy for whatever reasons. I mean, no quarrel that there will be some basis for it, but it begs that question how has this happened? Times South Africa number of employees 41,000, 
Singapore number of employees 351. South Africa total revenue 22 billion. Singapore total revenue 26 billion with 351 employees. Despite that high revenue in Singapore, very low, there, there is a net loss before tax. In South Africa, there is a, there, even in South Africa, there is a, sorry, in South Africa, there is a 10 billion dollar profit. And in South Africa, the CPCR effective tax rate is 28%, which is equal to the corporate tax rate in South Africa. Okay. It raises that question, there are higher revenues in Singapore vis-a-vis -vis South Africa, lower number of employees, a fraction of the employees in South Africa are there in Singapore. Despite that, there is something which is for which they will give notes saying now we will have accumulated loss. Question which comes then is how did you generate those accumulated losses? With 351 uh, employees and a very low asset base, and the asset base in South Africa is 10 billion dollars because there are a lot of mines over there. A lot of mines uh, will be there. Okay, so understand. But see the kind of questions it throws up. On the other hand, just visualize. South African authorities will have information only on South African uh, compliance. They will not have the visibility on all of this. Even if they download the cons consolidated financial statements of Anglo American from Anglo American's website, they will not get this answer. Right? That is the beauty of the CBCI. And, and uh, these are what I personally call design masterpieces. The form's design is so fantastic. It prima facie looks so simple and innocent. They are saying you don't apply your mind on uh, set offs or uh, consolidation knock offs. You simply add and you put. We will see later. And see the kind of results they have got. Fantastic results they have got. Okay. Um, yeah. So that is this. And yeah, then we will just go on. Uh, these are some points which we discussed, we will go through it quickly once again. Focuses on tax jurisdiction, like I said, tax jurisdiction could have multiple entities like we saw. Requires aggregation of information across entities in a jurisdiction without consolidation principles being applied, such as intra-jurisdiction RPT. Right? <coughs> what, what about index or non index revenues, notional income? Don't apply our mind, please. Because in India, there will be a lot of so called notional incomes, lease rate equalization, all those funny, funny kind of adjustments which they make. So the question comes whether that has to be reported. Don't apply your money, please include. Because finally, the CBCR should be aligned with the CFS and the local uh, entities' financials. That is all the purpose. So they are not bothered about the real income theory, income tax adjustments, etc. They are not bothered. They are simply looking for a summary information put out from local entity financial and the consolidated financials. Split in terms of related and unrelated party revenues to be undertaken at a jurisdictional level. So this, this is exactly what we discussed. Revenues, not only operating revenues, but also uh, but also includes sorry, but also includes passive incomes, excluding dividends. So the question comes: is this only operating revenue? For example, for Anglo-American, would it only be a typical sale of goods type of stuff and not include interest, interest on investments or whatever. The answer is simple. No, passive incomes also should be included except dividend. Except dividend, all other uh, passive incomes should be included. It includes other incomes for non-holding and non-financial So, we have this line item, right? Other income in our financials. That also gets coded. So, basically, it's not asking for much application of money. What happens is when we give all of this without that non application of mind, the results which come up are fascinating. That's all. TVAT excludes depreciation and interest, including all extraordinary incomes and expenses. So please don't exclude any extraordinary items. Okay, like how we do in our transfer pricing benchmarking analysis, we exclude some item of extraordinary items, we don't take it as operating. Item. No, no such application of mind. Extraordinary, please include. Because finally the purpose is it should be aligned to the CFS, it should be aligned to the standard of financials. 
income tax paid on cash basis includes TDS and reporting tax. No problem. Cash flow statements become the basis. So in the cash flow statement, we would have said this much is the income tax paid. Then we have income tax accrued. <coughs> Excludes deferred taxes and provisions for uncertain tax liabilities. Therefore, it includes provisions for ascertained tax liabilities. So, the provision for tax amount which is there, that is something which will be reflected in this column. Stated capital includes quasi equity capital so long as it is considered as capital. So, for example, CCDs. This is whether we need to include them. Typically, CCDs are considered to be part of capital. So, therefore, we take it. Again, there will always be the debate because it is uh, uh, as a name, all of that stuff. But then again, the OECD does not give explicit clarification on this. We can go ahead and exclude this also. But what we can do is we can give it as a note. Saying stated capital excludes CCDs are hybrid debt, hybrid capital. Quasi equity capital it excludes. Includes share premium. <coughs> do not know. So, depending on the facts, we can go to exclude it or include it. Whatever it is, let us give a note. What I would suggest is see how the CPCR will look if we include a share premium. If we exclude share premium, how does it look? Whichever is more advantageous to us, let us take that position, give a note. Because there is no R. It is not uh, some, we, end up, we won't be penalized for taking a view on all of these things. Accumulated earnings, alignment actually that is another part in the sense uh, in terms of penalties. Okay, so if you do not file a CDCR and all of those things there are penalties. But if you do not file master time form 3 CEA there are no penalties. Till date there are no penalties on this. So and again the, the, the penalties are <coughs> non-failing, not an incorrect failing or whatever. Okay, so. Not suggesting <laughs> this is a, a nuance in the law itself in, in the income tax act. Uh, employees, FTs, full time equivalents. So, this full time equivalents concept is primarily a Western concept. What is FT? FT is basically any person who puts in a 8 hour, eight hour day in a 5 day week. 40 hours uh, puts in that is an FT. That is our concept. In India, this is an alien kind of language. So what do we do? Any employee, any person whom we consider as an employee, please put it, put him here. Then the, the CBCR goes ahead and makes another statement that independent consultants may be reported as employees. So we would have taken a lot of people up con as contractors, employing them for a definite renewing their contracts and all of that, they were virtually as employees. So the question is whether we include them or not. They say maybe included. You include them, please give a note. If you don't include them, please give a note. Simple. Okay? Because finally, the, what is the purpose of all of this? The purpose is uh, actually if we bring in the independent contractors, we can actually boost up the number of employees and actually say that we've had significant presence. That is an important dimension. Total as at the end of the year based on average employment levels or any other basis that is consistently applied. So what is the number which we take? We typically take the number as of the last date of, of the year or we can take the weighted average also at this state. We need to do it only consistently. That is the only requirement. <coughs> now again the other question comes deputed em uh, employees and deputed personnel. Economic empire concept. So, for example, the parent entity would have deputed about 10 people to India, and the, those employees will work under the control and supervision of the Indian entity. Whose employees will they be? Are the Indian entity or of the parent entity? Okay, there I think as long as we take a consistent position that their employees of the Indian entity, we should be safe. Because that goes in line, that will be rather in line with the economic empire concept which is instituted in the OECD also. So I think that should be a fairly decent position. Okay? Again, there will be a contrary school of thought, which is fine. Because uh, if it is not reported here, it will be reported elsewhere, so be it. Okay? But then, 
the point which becomes critical thereafter is assume for a moment and this typically happens that deputed employees will be people in the senior management and then if we say that even the senior management is not in any are not reported in the Indian entities and the question comes then how is the Indian entity operating those questions will come so therefore we will have to take a judicious view of these and that's why it will be easy for us if we say they are employed they are employees of India and so be it because that will also protect that Indian entity so to say from an allegation of a service ERP itself so it will be safe so to say to take that view tangible assets other than cash and cash credits we need to take the net book value of the assets what is conspicuous is intangible assets are excluded financial assets are excluded ok for example Singapore we saw Anglo American Singapore they consider it as a hub. for all you know Singapore will be that APAC holding entity for the Anglo American group so while they have reported 416 million dollars of tangible assets their financial assets could be far higher than which has not found its way into the series so it appears to give a uh, what do you say unbalanced view tainted or skewed view of gives a skewed view of things with 419 million dollars of assets how has it been able to generate 22 billion of revenue right with only 350 employees right on the other hand, which we will see a little later, investment hubs appear to have a very high revenue per employee. Right? Which the OECD makes an observation that this is something which is very unique and which needs to be addressed appropriately. Okay? Fantastic uh, observations about in the section. So, uh, so finally, on CPCR. Panoramic and summary view, otherwise not available in any company information, let alone that of an entity. The view which it gives is fantastic. First of all, CFS will have a lot of accounting jargon which, uh, apart from accountants or tax professionals, do not understand. But the CBCR is a very, very, it's like a general knowledge kind of a booklet that entity. Far clearer than a CFS or a content care Actually, significant compliance for an entity to gather, consolidate by adopting a consistent approach and present. However, for that entity, it is a nightmare. Because you need to gather all of this information and present which you would otherwise not present. For example, Anglo Americans uh, CBCR, like I said, it runs up to 80 pages, and those nine items you saw, micro font, right? That runs up to about 8 pages micro part. So the information is quite voluminous. <coughs> and then in that backdrop, that focus on base erosion, which CBCR started on, has actually been fulfilled in its true sense. And that is my personal belief. If you see the action plans and the reports which the OECD issued, the success of the CBCR, the kind of information in which it is coming out with, far outstrips the success of all the other web section reports, say on digital economy. So the, the OECD, the digital economy action plan report, report number one, it said that digital services should be taxed in a certain way. There has been so much controversy on how to enforce and levy digital taxes. As soon as that report came, it was as if India was waiting to the institute equalization. Then, lot of countries in, in Europe, in, for example Canada also, they were seeing that there was no progress in uh, uh, global consensus on digital services taxes and they they instituted not similar to our equalization and that triggered a global trade war. US said we will, instead, we will uh, start sanctioning say UK, Germany etc. who had delivered digital services tax and the victims, so to say, of the DSTs were primarily US entities. They were the primary targets. And that is where uh, the US said we will levy uh, retaliatory tariff tariffs. So it, it triggered a trade war. So that was the outcome of action one. 
then say will be action two, action three. Not much progress, not much tangible and memorable progress. But CDCR is a welcome report. The, the outcomes which it has triggered are truly fascinating in the sense. So I was when I was just checking for uh, CDCRs which other companies have published. I I remember reading the word of one CDCR. Vodafone CDCR, Vodafone was one of the first companies to publish the CDCR. And thereafter, I was just checking uh, who, which other groups have uh, published the CDCR. It appears uh, primarily these large oil and gas companies. So, Shell, which we will go through, Shell has published it, Total Energy, ENI, uh, and uh, many of these mining companies, Rio Tinto, Anglo American, and many other mining companies, they have published it. The world's largest oil and gas company is Exxon Mobil. It's a US based company. Conspicuously, it's not published the CBCR. Why it has not published its CBCR? It has justified in one board resolution. If we read that board resolution, we we'll get to know that these fellows are heading, definitely heading something. Because the transparency with which the other oil and gas companies, including British Petroleum, BB, BB has published the CBCR. What stops Exxon Mobil? Answer is simple, their holdings and uh, operations in the Grand Cayman Islands, BVI, you know, all these tax havens are so high that they know for sure that if we report that and we will see we will see how that happens, how these tax havens have come in uh, Shell's, uh, I think Shell's, uh, I mean, uh, Shell's CDCR. <coughs> we get to know that because these guys are not in publishing their CDCRs uh, for uh, public consumption, there is some lambda which these days are doing. Apple, for example. I don't know whether Apple starts as exposed to Pro, but I don't find their CDCR. Okay. All of us know that uh, Apple was founded by the US and the UK authorities for uh, shifting profits uh, to Ireland or Guernsey uh, and all of those types of things. Apple hasn't published it and Apple makes such a big show of uh, responsible governance and all that. Points to food for thought. Right? Similarly, I couldn't find any large software services companies of the US having published these things. SAP, Oracle, huge giants there. Those guys didn't publish their CDC. On the other hand, Anglo American, one of the most controversial companies in the world mining etc. It's a very dirty business and those guys have taken the trouble of publishing this business. Shell, BP, all these guys are operating in an extremely dirty world. world. Those guys have published it. What's the problem with uh, American software companies? Right? And they talk so much about governance. Right? Points to point out. This is again some fantastic statistics from the OECD's uh, booklet called Corporate Tax Statistics. It's available on the OECD website. I've just taken some relevant screenshots. So, how many CBCRs are paid in 2020? Globally, about 7,000 CBCRs are paid. Globally, 7,000 CBCRs. That's why this was my first point with the chairman. This is a very niche topic. Globally, there are 7,000 CBCR files. That's all. Right? Very, very niche uh, kind of complaints. But then, the, the, uh, the perspectives which it throws up is very interesting. And then, if we do take a step back, when we do our regular TP audit, TP documentation, uh, TP reports, so to say, this is a macro perspective which we ought to ask our client. Say, first, globally, what do you guys do and what is India's role in the global supply chain? For example, if your client uh, for whom you, you are doing enterprise has about 15 subsidiaries around the world. Right? One uh, perspective which CBCR gives is to get that global perspective. Okay. Indian operations support R&D. Okay. What are your other entities doing? Some of them are they doing R&D? Are they doing sales and marketing? What are they? That perspective also gives us a more balanced uh, approach 
for preparing our own TP documentation. So, for example, assume that the US entity has about 15 entities globally, 15 subsidiaries globally. India is a development hub. It's we're talking about a software company. India is a development hub. The rest of the entities in the world are all sales and marketing places. Okay. India is being compensated on a cash plus basis. <coughs> there are huge profits which are made by the parent entity. The question which comes is, since R&D is, is the core or a critical component of a software entity, why should not India earn a share of the profits which the parent entity makes? To which the parent entity will say, look, R&D is only a part, unless I sell them well, I won't make these profits. I am making these profits because I am selling them well. That's a differentiator. Right? Therefore, my sales function assumes more importance vis-a-vis -vis my R&D function. It will be the response from the parent entity, which is a typical case of a transparency dispute. How much value would you attribute to each function. It is like saying, is your right eye more important than your right hand? Alright, alright. Are your right ear and nose more important than your two legs? Right? That is that is an eternal question in transfer pricing, which CDCR helps us give a perspective. And Seeing the kind of information which is asked here, I think we as a practice can ask our clients even in a simple TP documentation, say, I will prepare your TP documentation, okay, but it will help if you can give me a macro perspective so, I can, so that I can write your TP report better. In a TP assessment, I can defend your case better or I can highlight risks to you in a TP assessment what you can do to strengthen the narrative which you want to canvas, right? This macro perspective helps a lot. And then, uh, yeah, so number of MNEs, as of 2020, it's about 7,000. Again, uh, distributed geography-wise, uh, with uh, the Americas, Asia and Oceania and Europe taking the key uh, share again in the subsequent slide, I think. Then how many, num what are the number of entities which have gotten reported in the CBCR? So, to the 7000 is the total number of CBCRs. In the CBCRs, totally how many entities were reported? So, that is 3, 6, 7, 8, about 9 lakh entities have gotten registered. So, we saw in Anglo-American the number of multiple entities per jurisdiction, that is that, this is that. <coughs> Top three business activities by region. You know, fantastic chart. So in Africa, out of 50%, about 19% is sales, marketing, or distribution. Okay. 12%, right? 12% is manufacturing. 17.9% is administrative ma management or support services. So you see. But this is a very important indicator. Similarly, for other geographies, Asia and Oceania, sales and marketing constitute 22 percent. Right? What does this indicate? This indicates that manufacturing is not the manufacturing entities are not the key entities which have contributed to that multinational's presence in a respective country. It is the allied activities which have taken the lion's share. So about 22 percent in Asia and Oceania are distribution entities. Okay. Right? And then in Europe it is 20. Even in Europe it's, it's very high. So in that sense, the number of uh, the so to say value add by manufacturing appears to be the prime occasion. And the value add by a sales and marketing function appears to be high. Alright, again a food for thought. So the same example of R&D, which I gave, R&D and uh, sales function. This data bears that result out, saying without my sales entity, sales function there, the R&D is virtually worthless. 
right? Then uh, extract uh, sample composition and average value of for key financial variables. So in each country, how many <coughs> CBCRs got paid is the listing. This is the listing. So uh, Australia about 148. China 691 CBCRs. China, right? Uh, Germany 419. Hong Kong 231. India 144. Japan 904. Korea 247. US 1759. UK 399. This simply indicates the concentration of large multinational groups countries. Serial number 1 US, serial number 2 Japan, serial number 3 China, so to say, then comes Hong Kong, alright, and so on and so forth. That this, this simple chart shows where the large multinationals are concentrated. Fantastic uh, chart. Again, there it talks about related party revenues, unrelated party revenues, and there if you see unrelated party revenues are the highest in China, which is the consistent plea which both China and India are making that we are the market jurisdictions. Because of us, multinationals are surviving. This data bears out that proposition. Then uh, income tax approved of the number of employees. Number of employees again highest is China, second highest is India. Okay, so same proposition, but the, in terms of people, the user jurisdictions are what are contributing to multinational presence. Fantastic chart. Again, in this very report, the OECD says boss, please consume these charts wisely. Okay, because this is disaggregated data and then you can't take this data at its face value, rightly so. But then at least it's a good starting point, right? <coughs> then, MNE's contribution to total corporate income tax revenues, fantastic chart, okay? This is again country-wise, okay? Whether local affiliates owned by foreign MNEs or local affiliates owned by domestic MNEs, they are contributing to local corporate tax, okay, understood? Whether the country's corporate income tax is being contributed by a subsidiary of a local enemy or an overseas enemy. So if it is an overseas enemy, that means that economy is dependent on that overseas enemy. If it is the local enemy, that means the economy is not dependent on the overseas enemy. So enemy, sorry. Serial number one, Ireland. The, uh, how much is it? 95, 95% of Ireland's corporate income tax is contributed by local affiliates of overseas enemies, which bears out the allegation against Google, Apple, everybody. And boss, you guys are concentrating everything in Ireland, shifting profits to Ireland. Serial number two, Mauritius, old culprit. Wait, India has been fighting with Mauritius for dark years. So one good thing is we have finally signed up. Principal purpose test uh, uh, requirement into the India Mauritius Treaty recently. So that's a good uh, thing, but uh, let's see how, how it pans out. Serial number 2 is Mauritius, serial number 3 is Luxembourg, serial number 4 is Singapore, Denmark. No, Denmark uh, local affiliates are very high. So, wherever the dark uh, bar is there, right? The dark bar should be very low. Those are the uh, tricky jurisdictions, NLD, Netherlands, Pan, Panama. Panama is primarily because of these shipping companies. Okay, Panama is a hub for uh, global shipping entities. Then uh, comes New Zealand, Jefferslovakia, uh, Indonesia to some extent. But then it brings to the fore those global tax levels. These are the global tax levels. Okay. What is curious is Cayman Islands, BBI, all of them are not affected here. Okay. Maybe that's because they are, they are, they are not allowing themselves to go in at all. That's the same thing. Nothing. So it doesn't absolve them. 
Next come uh, top three business activities by region. <coughs> Uh, Asia and Oceania, 22% sales market. Yeah, so we went through this uh, in another part. Jurisdiction groups shares in foreign m &E activities. So, if we see this chart, what it indicates is there are high number of employees, okay, high number of employees in the m &E groups in the middle income countries. That's the first bar in the group of bars. So if you see that first bar is very high in middle income group, middle income countries. So that simply indicates that in middle income countries there are a very high number of employees of foreign multinationals. Which is that again that uh, uh, principle which India and China are making that our employees contribute to your revenue. <laughs> then similarly tax approved related party revenues all of that. Please see the fourth group, investment hub. See the number of employees is a very small bar, but the next uh, line, like, next bar of related party revenues is extremely high. Whereas you see exact opposite in the middle income uh, group. So what does that imply? That implies that with an investment activity, there will be very less employees, but very high revenues and returns. That is what that group of bars indicates, which is also supported by the Next chart, see that chart, the group of fibers, investment hub, median total revenues per employee is the highest in investment hubs across years from 2016 to 2020. Median total revenues per employee is the highest in investment hubs. So that uh, table in part B of the CBCR, which asks you to pick what kind of entity you are. Okay, and where you keep the investment or holding entities, it captures all of that data. So there, the number of employees were very low. The number of the value of revenues was very high. The, the, the profit before tax was very high. That is what this bar chart captures. That is the importance of that part B. All of these, these, these couple of charts which you saw come from part B. Right, uh, then, uh, comes uh, top three business activities for communities uh, a variant of uh, the area charts okay so with that i think this we've gone through now we are able to appreciate the, the, the each of the columns in the cbcr form okay this is an anglo-american then we we'll go through shells cbcr country specific we will go through so, this is an extract from Shell CBCR on Bermuda. Bermuda is a tax level. Okay. Third party revenues, 4 million. Related party revenues, 70 million. Total revenues, 74 million. Number of employees, 2. 2 employees. Without CBCR, nobody would have disclosed such information. Two employees in Bermuda with 74 million of revenue. Profit before tax, 50% of that, 36 million. Okay, tax paid, zero. Tax accrued, zero. Tangible assets, $91,000. Stated capital, $8.9 million. Accumulated earnings, $1.7 billion. <coughs> This is Shell's Shell company. Right? So then thereafter, there is a note, main business activities of this Bermuda entity. Other support activities, Shell has been present in Bermuda for more than 70 years with reinsurance, lending and pension fund companies incorporated there. So what are the entities that are there? They are clarifying that they, these are reinsurance, lending and pension fund companies. Very curious. Very, very curious. These companies manage activities such as filing of company accounts, collecting interest from loans and other administration. Something they have told. Okay, it's a good starting point. We also have companies in Bermuda which have branches in the UAE, Brunei, Qatar, Malaysia and Oman. 
This is because some countries do not allow foreign companies to establish corporate entities but do allow operations and activities to branches of entities registered or incorporated elsewhere. Nice note. So, we are establishing companies, branches, etc. to a Bermuda parent. Country financial analysis. Bermuda does not impose corporate income tax of companies which are resident there. Shell companies in Bermuda that have international activities through branches in other countries are subject to the applicable tax laws in the countries where those activities take place. Implicitly, they are accepting that these are shell companies without stating so. Right? The significant decrease in revenues in 2020 compared to 2019 is because proceeds from the sale of shares in Saudi Aramco, Shell Refinery Company, were included in the 2019 revenues. Were also lower uh, uh, in 2019. Revenues were also lower because we liquidated four entities based in Bermuda in 2020, including say Solent Insurance Limited, and we ended the financing activities of one entity, Shell Oman Trading. See the kind of information that you will never ever get this kind of information anywhere else. Right? This is our Shell's activities in Bermuda in the CBCR. Then comes here. <coughs> Very interesting. Third party revenues $1 billion. <coughs> Related party revenues $924 billion. Total revenues $2 billion. Profit before tax $162 billion. Tax paid $90 billion. $19. Okay. PBT $162. Tax paid $19. Tax accrued $48 million. Tangible assets 1 billion, stated capital 1 billion, accumulated earnings 196 million. Main business activities <coughs> upstream and integrated gas, new energies, downstream, trading and supply, other support activities. Shell has been present in India for about 28 years and mostly in downstream activities through Shell India Markets Private Limited. Downstream activities mean the petrol bunk, that is a downstream activity. In 2008, Shell started its business operations and projects and technology activities. In 2019, Hazra Port Private Limited and Shell Energy India Private Limited uh, became 100% Shell owned with integrated gas and trading and supply activities. Shell in India has an interest in companies operating in downstream solar power, EV charging and biofuels. In 2019, Shell ended its 25-year product production sharing contract between PG Exploration and the Government of India. So and so is all decommissioned. Country financial analysis is very important. The statutory corporate tax is between 25 and 30 depending on the type of business activity. Profits and whether tax exemptions and deductions offered by India are paid. The effective tax rate for foreign entities is 43.68%. Tax paid during the year relates to profits arising from business activities including services rendered through shell business operations and projects and technology. This is very important. Shell claims tax exemption for its Shell business operations relating to IT activities as they are located in an SEZ. For more information, refer to the case study on this explains why despite profit before tax of 162 million, the tax paid is only 19 million. This is the explanation. Similarly, explanations are given for all the three countries. It's an amazing read. We read the shell. I mean, all these uh, CDCRs, they give us a perspective of how these multinationals are. Fantastic uh, data. Singapore, shell, as interesting as Anglo American. <coughs> Third party revenues, 29 billion. Related party revenues, 32 billion. Okay. Total revenues, 61 billion. Singapore. How many employees? 3,975 employees. Very good number. PBT, 1 billion. Tax paid, 12 million. PBT, 1 billion. Tax paid, 12 million. Accrued tax, 20 million. Tangible assets, 9 billion. Stated capital, 11 billion. Accumulated earnings, 4 billion. <coughs> we'll just uh, jump to the country financial analysis. Uh, uh, more importantly, one part is the main business activities. We have treasury operations in Singapore and provide pension fund management and pension trustee activities for Shell initials. So, that is the 
service is this now. The statutory corporate income tax rate in Singapore is 17 percent. Shell in Singapore, in Singapore generates significant revenue but also incurs substantial operation, operation costs. In 2020, profit fell for a number of reasons including the surplus of fuel supply in the region and a significant drop in demand and prices as a result of COVID-19. Shell's manufacturing and capital business in Singapore continue to make capital investments. Singapore allows current year capital allowances on such investments and losses to be offset against the taxable profits of most entities. Tax authority in one year is typically paid in the following year. Singapore has granted some Shell companies tax incentives based on our contribution to the local economy, including local employment, local business expenditure and strategic partnerships with local industry participants. That is the reason why the tax paid in Singapore is so low despite the this is the perspective which CPC has. Not available in TP report, of course. Not available in master fair, of course. Not available in CFS. Not available in anything. Not available even in their tax return. Only when even shell for that matter, which steps back from its uh, Singapore compliance that says, this is the reason why the effective tax rate for us is low. That is the beauty of it. These are all these nuances which come out of that simple design masterpiece under the Form 3 C E AD, which is aligned of course to the OECD. Okay, with this uh, we wrap up CDCR nuances. Some quick points on recent developments, nothing much like I said. So in uh, 2023 there was a peer review which the OECD conducted on now uh, CDCR compliance. So basically it was checking whether local laws are up to date, the information gathering or the process of filing the forms are fairly simple, straightforward, no complications, etc. And then uh, uh, what it finally concluded is uh, over 110 jurisdictions have already introduced legislation to impose a filing obligation on MNE groups, calling practically all MNE groups with consolidated group revenue in excess of 750 million euros. Remaining inclusive framework members are working towards finalizing their domestic legal frameworks when the support of the OEC. So this number of uh, 7,000 MNEs at least could go up to around 8-9,000 and it will possibly stagnate there because that is so that is because by 2020 there was substantial coverage of the CDCR uh, uh, provisions most of the countries most of the key countries for example you see US, UK, Germany, China, Japan, India I mean Australia all those big countries where uh, MNE groups are uh, Headquartered, all of them have filed their CDCR. So there's nothing more, no more, no new country which will come into the framework. Where legislation is in place, implementation of CBC reporting has been found largely consistent with Action 13 minimum standard. A large number of recommendations made in the first five peer review phases have now been addressed, and these recommendations have been removed. More than 3,000 bilateral relationships for the exchange of CDCR are now in place. So this has been the extensive engagement of CBCRs amongst the countries. Development of Pillar 2. So Pillar 2 is another initiative of the OECD to state that globally large multinationals should pay a minimum tax, global minimum tax is what they call, which they call it as the globe rules. What are globe rules? Global anti-base erosion model rules. So, the globe rules state that an MNE in each jurisdiction has to pay minimum of 15 percent. No. How will you identify whether that entity has paid X percent or less than 15 percent? And there, CBCR is the first document to identify. And to ensure alignment of CBCR with pillar 2 requirements, there are some clarifications which were provided. Very hyper technical there, I have not. Into it. One important thing again is pillar 2, this global minimum tax. It applies finally to only about 120 companies in the world. In the world, only 120 companies. It's extremely niche. Okay. So, pillar 2, 120, the CBCR about uh, 7000, 8000, very narrow group, but then the kind of perspectives which they give and uh, all these uh, politically touchy dimensions of corporate tax evasion, base erosion, profit shifting, the, the 
the, the information which has come through the CBCR process, the master pipe process, it has done something which has not happened in the in about 250 years of uh, uh, global trade. Right? Global trade started off with the East India Company. Right? God only knows how much taxes East India Company paid. Right? But then if there was an East India Company today, you would have known how much East India Company would have earned through the CBCR. Right? This is an unprecedented set of rules. Okay, unprecedented in the past 250 two years, right? And this phenomenon, right? The kind of transparency which is coming. So there is uh, uh, another uh, transparency uh, standard called GRI. So ExxonMobil, which I told you, which did not publish its uh, CBCR, it said was we are complying with GRI, which is the, an equally uh, equally demanding standard, and where we have reported uh, what is to be reported. So which is fine, but then uh, uh, CBCR is something which, which especially when, when all of these companies have shown the way by publishing it on their websites, it's a fantastic move because all these days, Shell, all these all these companies who who I, who I mentioned, they they are all politically important companies. In the world. For example, De Beers, it controls many South African countries because of its engagement in those local economies. Shell is an important player in, 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 uh, in petroleum, natural gas across the world. And they, they have the ability to change governments in these key jurisdictions. And when such entities have opened up and showed that this is what we are, it gives a lot of hope, saying, OK, base erosion and profit shifting may not happen in the future. Yes, there's still a long way to go. But uh, this, these are baby steps and uh, I think uh, when we also develop this kind of a perspective, I am sure in our typical, our day-to-day -day TP documentation, uh, we can give quite a bit of value add to our clients also. So uh, with that, uh, I will uh, close my points. Any questions, please can mention. I hope you were able to relate to the CBCR concept, although like I keep saying it's a very esoteric thing, but a very enlightening thing. Right? Any questions? Open to it. Thank you. Thank you. India did form a directorate <coughs> for undertaking assessments. Oh, sorry? India formed a directorate for undertaking assessment based on CBCR data sometime. It was, I think, two years, three years back. Yes. Any further development no, or no any news at least in the public domain? But we don't intend to con uh, do audits on. No, so the, again, the, the difficulty is the bandwidth of the local TPO. So, for example, Shell. I think Shell is either in Bombay or Delhi. I think it's in Delhi. The file is in Delhi. So, uh, and for all you know, all, many of these multinationals who file CBCRs, they could have gone for APAs or NAPs also. So those dimensions are there. To the extent it is not there, or even in the NAP or APA discussion, the CBCR plays a very important role for the Indian uh, competent authority to negotiate. To say that, uh, look, uh, this is the intensity, functional intensity which these entities have here. And it is important that a higher income is attributed to the Indian jurisdiction. Uh, but uh, nothing uh, in the news on how they use it. Simply because the TPOs do not have the bandwidth or the aptitude to go through this document. First, they are not even aware that uh, they can ask for this document through proper channel. Right? And that's why it's still a long way to go. Because all our TPOs are uh, primarily today focused only on comparables following last year's order. Right? And uh, it takes a lot of uh, initiative for that TPO to actually go through a master file CBCR. So we will just have to hope that they go through this. Because as, as, as professionals, I mean, we are citizens of this country first, professionals later. And then uh, there, if I uh, see that a foreign entity uh, is, is uh, eroding its base in India, tax base in India, wouldn't I want to claim my rightful share? Yes. That, was, uh, our, that was what our independence movement was about. Right? The British were squeezing India. Right, so they don't mean.
no, uh, despite having this information, if they are not able to get a right full share, it would be inappropriate. Although, of course, we have to do it in the within the four corners of the law. And the law permits it. You only have to take that extra initiative of going through all of this. Yes, let's hope that they do. Okay. Chairman, sorry. Have a big round of applause for the speaker. Thank you so much for coming all the way and then doing this better on a you know long weekend and in, in, in midst of holidays. Thank you. On behalf of Bengaluru branch, we express our gratitude for this. Can I request our chairman to hand over the moment to us? members for taking your time out and attending this uh, session and study circle meeting. Thank you.